Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Zatarans, a New Orleans tradition since 1889, and by French Market Coffee, locally roasted in New Orleans for 125 years. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. If you're a Louisiana Eats listener, it's a good guess you just might be a food TV binger. On this week's show, we're going to examine food TV from every angle, beginning with the youngest new food TV star, Kai Hecht, recent winner of Chop Jr., Maybe Chef Michael Galata of MoFo and Maypop fame could use some pointers from Kai as he competes this season on the new Iron Chef gauntlet. We'll catch up with Michael just as the new season of Iron Chef is beginning, and then we'll talk with well-seasoned food TV stars John Besh and, hold on to your hats, ladies, Aaron Sanchez. Get the popcorn and get ready for Food TV, the Louisiana Eats way. After a competitive Food TV show like Iron Chef or Chopped Wraps Production, contestants will often throw a viewing party in their own restaurants. But what if the contestant is only 10 years old? When Kai Hecht made his food TV debut on Chop Jr., he hosted his screening on Tulane's campus at Hillel's Kitchen with hundreds of friends and family in attendance. We're so excited for everybody to be here tonight. Congratulations to Kai for all of his hard work. To get an understanding of how the 10-year-old Kai came to be a contestant on the program, we invited him and his father, Michael Hecht, to join us in the Louisiana Eats studio. I'm Michael Hecht, and I'm the proud father of Kai Fries Hecht. My name is Kai Fries Hecht. I go to Lusher Charter School, and I'm 10 years old. Well, and you're also a TV champion, a TV cooking champion, and right here in our midst in New Orleans, I am really impressed. So how did this process work, Michael? How in the world did Kai become involved on competition television? Well, it started as a bit of a lark. I think that Kai had mentioned that he would like to be on Chop Jr. And my wife, uh, Marlena, to her credit, said, well, what's the worst that can happen? So she sent in an application, and then we ended up doing an audition video at my wife's ancestral house in a little city called Streep, where the biggest city next to it is called Milfart, uh, in the middle of Denmark. Kai's mother is Danish, and so Kai is Danish-American, so we go every summer. And we did it in um, my wife's grandmother's kitchen. And from there, it was just many, many interviews, many, many legal documents, and it finally ended up in Chelsea Studios in New York City. So once we get the um, notification that I made it on Chopped, it's dead secret. I can't say anything. We signed a contract and everything. Was it hard? It was hard but easy at the same time making it on. It was a long process with a lot of Skype interviews, phone calls, and eventually leading up to one um, video of me cooking my signature dish. What is your signature dish? So I really have about two signature dishes. One of them would be this fish taco that I made with a bright mango salsa on it. The other one would be this Danish dish called Shanisku. It's a lot of components. It's basically 
a pan fried piece of fish with asparagus, black caviar, butter lettuce leaf, and then the sauce, which is a base of mayo, creme fraiche, paprika, tomato paste, and it's really good. Yum. Where in the world did you learn to make that? That can't be something you're having in your grandmother's kitchen. I learned this in Denmark at a local fish store that they have. And they gave us a strand of school. I tried it, and I knew I wanted to make this when I got home. Well, it must have been an extra bit of excitement then for you to have Marcus Samuelson be one of the judges. Um, I hear you all speak the same language, literally. Yeah, I speak um, Danish. He speaks Swedish. So we have a little bit of connection that way. Um, a lot of my plating draws inspiration from nature, the outside, just like they do in Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Kai, tell me about your fellow competitors. Um, so there's a girl named Emerson that is, that's from New Jersey, another girl named Bria that's from Virginia Beach, Virginia, and a boy named Chris that's from uh, Arizona, Gilbert, I believe. Well, we meet at the Hilton Inn right before the competition, and um, when we go in the um, bus to get down to Chelsea Market, um, we just get to interact with each other, get to know each other. So then we have a lot more fun in the competition itself. Kids, that clock is not stopping. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. If you really get to know someone, it makes it even harder to compete against them, doesn't it? I think it does, but after the first five, seven minutes of competing, you sort of forget everything. You forget the cameras, the lights, anybody around you. You just get into your comfort zone and start cooking. And I think that's what needs to happen to produce a great plate of food. Well, you did it. You certainly did it. All right, let's taste some appetizers. You're up first, Kai. What'd you make? Um, so what I made for you is chorizo in woods. Deep fried chorizo with sauce. And Michael, were you there watching? Do you do they take the kids away from you? Are the how does that work? Well, it, it, it was it was torture on two levels. Uh, they go and they take all the parents and they sequester us in a separate room, and you have to stay there all day and even be escorted to the restroom. So it's it's physical torture, but it's mostly kind of emotional torture because we're all watching our children uh, as they are taping the show or watching on a monitor. And so, you know, it's, it's just uh, excruciating to see your child there and to see the clock ticking away. The kids were cool. The parents, for us, it was a disaster. You know, one of the parents was a smoker and kept wanting to go out for a cigarette break because they were so nervous. But they had to be escorted out at certain times. So, um, no, we, it was, I think, harder on the parents than the kids, frankly. Next up, Kai. What'd you make? Hi guys, what I've made for you today is Kai's campfire dinner. It's his grilled pork tenderloin with sauteed red long beans and a red wine pineapple sauce. Kai, was there any moment during the competition when you went, <gasps> uh oh? I think there was. When I vacuum sealed the pork, a lot of that water and liquid came into the pork. So, cooking time. It could be a little off because the texture becomes different when you're feeling it, see how well it's cooked. So I was a little nervous about that. It ended up being three minutes overcooked, but I think overall it went well. As we were going on to the set, I said to Kai, whatever you do at the end, do not make ice cream. You've never made ice cream. You've never used a machine. It's where challenge chefs go to die. So it comes to the final round. And the final ingredients come out there, and one of them is coconut milk. And, coconut milk. and what's the first thing that Kai does? He runs to the ice cream machine. Once again, you got to get your dishes done in just 30 minutes. And as Harveen said, he smashed it, and the coconut ice cream with the strawberry nerds uh, rolled in was delicious, and he made that with a chocolate matcha molten cake and a fruit compote with sugar and salt all in 30 minutes. And so that was the... Uh, <laughs> 
pièce de résistance. So Kai was, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, young enough to ignore me and old enough not to care. It was great. So what's going to come next, Kai? Now that you've had this taste of fame and fortune, what what, what did you win? Um, so my prize for winning was ten thousand dollars, along with the um, Chop Junior Chef coat which be arriving soon. And what will you be doing with your $10,000, Kai? So I'm planning on saving some of it for my future restaurant, Um, saving some of it for my college fund, and then I'm going to donate some of it to um, the New Orleans Food Bank. My goodness. Well, your heart is certainly in the right place. When do you think you're going to get that restaurant? Um, anywhere between 20, 21. Dad, how do you feel about all this? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously so proud and so thrilled. And I think the thing that really crossed my mind as I was watching not just Kai, but the other children during the show is how if you give young children the opportunity to stretch themselves and give them the chance to be challenged and to succeed, they can do extraordinary things. And maybe in our schools today, with so much focus on testing and filling in the bubble, we're not doing enough of really challenging our children and allowing them to really stretch themselves and show what they can do because these kids are completely amazing. Well, it's really exciting to meet you, Kai, and I'm so tickled to finally meet you. I'm such a big fan of your dad. Michael, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. And Congratulations on what an amazing boy you have. Well, Poppy, thank you so much for being such an inspiration and a muse for us here in New Orleans. We're really honored to be here. La, 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 la. Kai Hecht, Chop Junior champion, and his father, Michael. Wonder Boy, that's just bigger. When we come back from a short break, we speak with Chef Michael Galata of MoFo and Maypop, who's currently a contestant on Iron Chef Gauntlet. Stay tuned. Life is I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Rouse's Markets and from the Napoleon House, located in the historic French Quarter, home of the Pim's Cup Cocktail and the Toasted Mufalada. Lunch, dinner, and private events at 500 Charter Street. My name is Michael Galata. I am the chef partner of Mofo Restaurant and now Maypop Restaurant. And I'm currently on the reboot of uh, Iron Chef America called Iron Chef Gauntlet. With a growing number of popular restaurants in his hometown of New Orleans, Michael Galata has already proven himself to be a winner. As a contestant in the new Iron Chef reboot, Michael is now taking up a new gauntlet. And this time with a much larger audience. Michael joined us in our studio to talk about his participation in the iconic Iron Chef series and how it all came about. Uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. We were getting ready to open Maypop, and uh, I got a call, and someone said that Iron Chef was looking, and they threw my name in the ring, and they said, you should, you should try this out. I'm going to get you in contact with their casting people, and... I don't know. My, my business partners and I were like, well, literally our conversation was, do you think you can make it past the first round? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, I think I can make it past the first round. So that was kind of the idea. Like, just don't be the first person to go home. Because, you know, it, it, we know that it's fun. And it's one of those ones that I grew up 
watching. Well, I was in culinary school when the original one was, one was on, and and it's it's just it's all about just going out there. You're up against people who are just as has just as many years of experience as you do, and you know they are, everyone on there owns restaurants. Some of them have up to five or six restaurants, which is amazing. So it's a really level playing field, and which is exciting. Well, speaking of running their own restaurant, if not more, of course, your first effort, Mofo, has been just a smashing success. It's a favorite to everybody I know. And how did this timing work out with Iron Chef and you opening your new place, Maypop? Probably as bad as it could have worked out. <laughs> uh, Maypop was open for two weeks, and then I left to do the filming. And how long did the filming take? Uh, about two weeks. So yeah, it was rapid fire, and that was one of the things that they said. They like we, you know, we're, they told us we're trying to get in restaurant chefs. We know y'all are busy. You know, when you get here, you, we're not going to put you on a lockdown to where you can't call your teams and things like that. And like we, and we're not going to keep you any longer than we have to. You know, so it was it was really cool on their part. What was it like the first day? It was way harder than I anticipated. Uh, when when, <laughs> when you know they set you in there and you're like, okay, you know, I know how to cook, and then. They gave us 30 minutes, and it was just like, oh, 30 minutes, okay. I need to do a dish that can beat out six really well-known chefs in 30 minutes. And so that's that's a tough one. And the thing is, it's like you don't, it's not, you don't get a practice round. It's right. 30 minutes, and whoever's in the bottom goes to elimination. And you're like, oh, God, okay, all okay. right. Okay, ouch. <laughs> ouch. What did you cook? Uh, I did I, said I did a vindaloo curry because I kind of wanted to set you know the tone for what I, the style that I cook. And so I was like, well, i got to see if I can pull off a, a, a 20 minute curry. I figure I need to get the curry done in 20 minutes and then cook whatever I'm going to serve it with in the re- remaining 10. So I did a red currant vindaloo curry and then I put it over buttermilk fried quail because I, you know, frying quail is just one of those things that I, I think I can do in my sleep. Well, the original Iron Chefs, the, the ones from Japan, were like a cult right. thing to all of us. We all watched them avidly and then. We began to see the American iterations mm-hmm. of that format. What is the new gauntlet format like? So every day or every morning, we get there and we have the chairman's challenge, which means that uh, Alton Brown would raise the the, the the ominous coffin lid, and then we would have uh, to all cook against each other with, with whatever guidelines he set forth. Which I'm terrible at because I never followed the guidelines. And I think I kept making him angry with me because I would just cook whatever I wanted to cook. He's like, no, it's supposed to be like woodsy and wild. And, or no, it's supposed to be like this. And I'm like, I just cook what I thought tasted good. Uh, and I think I got in trouble a couple of times on that. But um, And then if, if you're in the bottom round, then you have to go to an elimination round, which means you get a new uh, hidden object. And then you get judged by um, some other Food Network stars. So they bring in – typically they pair an Iron Chef with – another Food Network star, and then they both, they two judge you. And so if you may, if you don't make the elimination round, then you go home. If you do make the elimination round, then you go back into the mix and you have to do the chairman's challenge the next day until you get all the way to the end. And then the last person standing then has to go up against three different Iron Chefs in a row to see if they can become the next Iron Chef. So the tricky part about this whole thing is that at the end of the day, no one might win. It right. could be that no one wins. Because one of the... Previous <clears throat> Iron Chefs. Yeah, if can they can't beat, try- well, you have to beat three in a row. If you can't beat three of them in a row, then you cannot be an Iron Chef. This is incredibly hard. I'm not sure I would sign up for this. Who are the Iron Chefs that, towards the end, you have to compete with if, uh, you're, if you make it that far? Morimoto. So he's one of the originals from back in, in Japan. And then um, uh, Bobby Flay and Michael Simon. So you have to beat all three of them in a row to become an Iron Chef. Yeah, it seems a little ludicrous. You know, there's so many different styles of these shows that have been on and you're always wondering like how would I measure up if I were on one of them and you always like to tell yourself oh I'd be great but if you have a bad day you know that's all it is some of these chefs are awesome and if they have a bad day they cut themselves they drop something something doesn't work and then suddenly your your dishes don't come together and you're out and so it's it's hard you have to be really really and and the and the truth of it is is you know sometimes it's the ones that can just focus better Almost everyone there either has a beard award or a best new chef award or some kind of huge award, and they want you know their, their restaurants are phenomenal restaurants, but it's all who, about who can do it most precisely in that short amount of time. Uh, and you know, and some of us were quite honestly, I think some of us are a little rusty because we've been too busy overseeing companies, not really on the ground cooking. And so it was interesting to have see us like pull out our knives again. You know, I know with me, I, I expedite my restaurants every night and I taste food. But when was the last time I had to pull out a knife and actually? cut up and chop and, and get things ready for service 
Uh, well, there have been a few days when the restaurant first opened, but most of the time I'm just tasting and overseeing and expediting and, and checking on tables. And so it's weird to, to, to pull that knife bag back out and be like, oh God, I got to do this. Okay. Okay. Let's get, let's get focused. <laughs> Make sure these things are sharp. I haven't used them in a while. What was it like the night that your Iron Chef episode airs when it, when the show well, begins to air what was <laughs> what did you do that night michael i actually fell asleep it was after it was after easter dinner and so i literally passed out uh you know i have, I have a restaurant that's only three months old so i've, I've kind of been <laughs> it's worse than a three-month-old baby yeah i've kind of been burned and i have twin boys and another restaurant plus the two satellite restaurants so it's like you know I, that was our first day. We the, all the restaurants have been closed in a while, and so I literally ate Easter dinner and then fell asleep. Promptly <laughs> fell asleep, and then my phone started like literally vibrating next to me to the point where it woke me up. And I was like, "Oh my god!" I actually woke up. It's I think it aired at nine, and I woke up at like nine oh five, and I was like, "Oh god!" And so I'm missing myself on TV. <laughs> everyone was like, "Are you watching it?" I'm like, "I'm actually not awake." <laughs> so it was well, all the chefs, all the competitors, we all of course exchanged phone numbers and everything. So they were all we were all texting each other about how it looked and everything. And so they were all like, are you up? Are you watching it? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm not awake. I'm so weird about that kind of stuff. Like, I, My mom thinks I'm nuts because whenever I do any kind of TV appearances, I never tell her about it. And she's like, why don't you tell me? I'm like, I don't know, because I get embarrassed being on TV. I think I'm not going to do very well. <laughs> I always think I'm going to make a mistake, especially if it's something live or something really big like that. I'm like, I'm afraid I'm going to look like an idiot, so I don't tell anyone. And then, and then once they tell me how I did the first time, then I kind of, I'm like, okay, I guess we're all right. And what so. about your twin boys? What did they have to say, Dad? Um, They didn't. They they are they are not they don't, they're not my impressed. Boys, no, they are not <laughs> impressed by anything like that. Would you do it again? Um, yeah, it was fun. No matter what, it's fun, you know. And the cool thing is, is like win, lose, or draw. New Orleanians will get. I mean, come on, they we've supported the Saints forever, so they're gonna say like it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. When win, lose, or draw, your city supports you because you know I'm a born and raised New Orleanian. At least I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Chef Gauntlet contestant and local favorite, Chef Michael Galata. Aaron Sanchez and John Besh are household names both in and outside of New Orleans, especially if there's a TV in that household. The two friends have appeared on food shows like Iron Chef and Chopped. Now the co-owners of modern Mexican eatery, Johnny Sanchez, Aaron and John see their early days on TV together as a turning point in both their careers and their friendship. During our latest chat with the two celebrity chefs, Aron described how he and John were first brought together on the set of The Next Iron Chef. We knew each other initially just from casual interactions, but when we went to do the first season of Next Iron Chef, that's really where we cemented the our, our friendship. But it was this idea of what in food television is, is a, a title that you want worth aspiring to. And at that time, being an Iron Chef was the one thing that he and I could honestly say, that's worth striving for. That's worth, you know, kicking your butt for. And during that process, we learned a lot about each other and a lot about ourselves through it. Don't miss it this October when the Iron Chef legacy continues as eight super chefs from around the country travel over international waters and battle it out in the biggest culinary adventure to come to television, the next Iron Chef. So how is it really, Aaron, to be a star on food TV? Well, you know, it's it's a blessing, to be very honest. And I can tell you, uh, initially, the reason I started doing it was to get people into the, the restaurants. And then the mission changed, I think, just like anything else. Now I find myself uh, sort of using the television medium as uh, this sort of interchange between my culture and giving people information. So imagine, if you live in Sioux Falls, Iowa, and you don't have a Latin community next to you, you can actually make Mexican-inspired food from me and transmit a message extremely quickly and impactful. I think now what we've seen is that food TV, TV has shifted from a studio format where, you know, John's 
uh, maybe preferred medium would be doing a show at home, him cooking, sharing experiences in the traditions of New Orleans with his audiences. And then now it's shifted from that to competition and reality. And, you know, what's that next thing that's, you know, that's getting people going? And I've seen the shift. And it, we struggle as chefs to become chefs first and TV personalities second. And I really have to give a lot of love to our team because they have really positioned me as a chef first and a TV person second. But it is a struggle with you yeah, on a yeah. personal basis. Oron's yeah. always fired up saying, no, I'm, I'm a chef. And yeah, you are. But they know you as this television personality, which is awesome because I think what he's talking about is that his stage is so much broader. He can touch so many more people through this media. And I think you just have to understand that TV and cooking, it, it is just a broader audience than what you happen to have in your in your dining room while you're there, and that it, you can use it for good. So I love my series that we film at the house and uh, that That's airs a luxury. on. Luxury. <laughs> what well, is? It's not bad when you can just walk downstairs and start working. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact is, is that use it for what it is. It's a it's a medium. It's it's a means to. Take your message of, you know, what Paul Prudhomme passed on to me, and that was this tradition of having Louisiana uh, cooking filmed here, produced here, and sent to the world to enjoy. And how about you, Aron? Were you nervous when you started? How did you get comfortable with this? Well, you know, for me, I think the biggest insight I can give people is don't take it too seriously, you know, and be yourself and understand that. Uh, this is a medium that can be very fleeting. It can be very fickle. You can fall out of favor. But I think that the one thing that has kept me relevant is that I've worked on myself and I've given people a reason to put me back on air. And that requires you going and getting inspired by travel, being inspired by your craft, be inspired by your loved ones. And that what keeps you relevant. And that's what people want to tune back into you. Being the next Iron Chef would be an absolute joy. This is a win-win all the way. I think the whole process of getting there, if that does indeed happen, will be something that is going to be as enriching as the end, the, the prize. I want to be, you know, the best I can be. What fuels your art, Aaron? My peers is a big one. Your your pride for your culture. My pride for I my culture. I think more than anything. When, yeah. when I hear you talk passionately, when I, about your show, you want to represent people who don't have a voice. Exactly. And, and and it's not fair for me to walk into all these restaurants across the country in my travels and have the Latinos come out and say, I can be like Aron, you know, and I can go out there. And I'm that voice for every, you know, recently arrived immigrant from a Latin country that maybe doesn't master the English language and understands that they can achieve that and be bicultural. And it's like, I'm, that's a huge responsibility for me. And I want to make sure that I conduct myself properly and continue to work on myself personally so I can be the best example. And what fuels you, John? I love the stories behind our food. I love the stories behind culture. I love to learn and I love to share. And um, what drives me to do any more TV for the rest of my life will only be sharing our culture with other people. The most important thing about being the next Iron Chef would be a reward for my staff. I think it's good for me just to always keep my eye on the ball and keep focused on what's real. This is great. This would be a lot of fun. Let me ask you this. If you had some words for all of those toddlers who have been watching you uh, on the Food Network, who might be teenagers now, what would you caution them about TV versus the real world? Well, I mean, one, I'm too old. They don't. I made you remember on the radio, I darling. I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. But, but it is amazing walking down the street with Sanchez and just seeing the goo goo eyes. <laughs> Every young lady on it seems in New Orleans is, you know, just watch this guy on on episode after episode of Chopped. And um, <laughs> the way he handles it, and he won't speak for himself, but is through humility. And he'll go up and he'll hug and kiss and take pictures and swap you know, Instagrams and, and engage the people saying, hey, I'm just an ordinary guy. 
But John, what you just actually did was fuel those every high school senior to become Aaron Sanchez. So, because I mean, everybody yeah. wants well, to swap them. Instagrams, I want to be Aron, I want to have a car have like Aaron Sanchez taken one day. And have everybody swoon when you walk down the street. <laughs> what do you have to say to that, Aaron? Well, I'm trying to get my life right, Poppy, at every corner, and I got a girlfriend now, so that's a good step. Mm, and that's big news. That's big news, and I guess we're breaking it here. But the idea is just always trying to improve. And I think my, my words of caution to young people that are, have aspirations of being on television is television is a byproduct of being really good at your craft. And it's, it's, it's a supplement. Or it should be. It should be, you know, in, in the traditional sense of why television exists, you know. And I think, you know, for better or worse, like, we're, we're cursed. Because, like, you know, when Cary Grant played a role, you believed it because you didn't know what he was doing in his personal life. And now because of social media, everyone knows what everyone's doing. So it's harder to really sort of have that escapism with people that you admire. And I think what makes us different as chefs is that I can't dunk a ball like Kobe Bryant or I can't do, uh, sing a song, you know what I mean, like like Bruno Mars or whatever. But you can make my chicken recipe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> accessibility. Yeah, like there's that accessibility about. that chefs provide people. And I think that's, that's what makes it special. Food TV stars and celebrity chefs, Aaron Sanchez and John Besh. World crashes in into my living room. Television made me what I am. Who was New Orleans' original food TV star? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. Edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, and from French Market Coffee. French Market Coffee's premium blend beans are locally roasted in small batches, creating a coffee that can only be called New Orleans Bold. Here's this week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. Who was New Orleans' original food TV star? Long before Emeril ever uttered his first BAM, Lena Richard was already a New Orleans food TV celebrity. In the late 1940s, Lena made food history with her weekly cooking show, broadcast from the Municipal Auditorium and aired on WDSU. Sponsored by Wholesome Bread, the show aired twice weekly on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 p.m. Her cooking career began as a child when she worked as a domestic alongside her mother and aunt at the Esplanade Avenue home of Alice Nugent Varon. She received her first paycheck there at the tender age of 14. But Mrs. Varon recognized her talent and sent her to study cooking at the famous Fanny Farmer's Cooking School in Boston, where she graduated in 1918. Lena was a popular New Orleans caterer and eventually also a restaurateur. But her teaching skills cannot be underestimated. With the help of her daughter, she opened her first cooking school in 1937. Lena performed cooking demonstrations for white New Orleans socialites at the Bethlehem Temple in the French Quarter. But nothing could top that in 1949, 3,000 women of color attended Lena Richard's School of Cooking and Baking, held in the Booker T. Washington High School Auditorium. Sadly, 
On November 27, 1950, at the height of her career, Lena suffered a fatal heart attack just hours after leaving her popular restaurant, The Gumbo House. Lena Richard has long been one of my great Louisiana food heroes. You can learn more about Lena and see a copy of her cookbook at the Bonnie and John Boyd Hospitality and Culinary Library at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Sorry, Emeril, but before you were even born, Lena Richard was New Orleans' number one food TV star. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. fan of Bravo's Top Chef, surely you saw and rooted for our very own Louisiana-born Chef Isaac Toops last year when he competed in the show's 13th season. Isaac made it all the way to the season's finale in Las Vegas, but was told to pack his knives and go home just before the final elimination challenge. When Isaac returned to New Orleans as the season's fan favorite, his new celebrity brought him and his wife Amanda a whole world of opportunities. Over the past year, Louisiana Eats had the great fortune of chronicling Isaac's experiences on Top Chef and keeping a bird's eye view on the accompanying fame. After all, since Top Chef, Isaac and Amanda have opened a second restaurant, Toop South, right here at our studio's home in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Before we share our conversation with Isaac, reflecting back on his journey, here are some highlights from our earlier conversations with him, both in our studio and at his restaurant when the season first aired. Hi, Isaac Toops, chef, owner, partner of Toops Meadery, restaurant in Mid-City in the fabulous city of New Orleans, and a chef testing on this season of Top Chef, season 13. So... How does Bravo vet you for this? How does this happen? Do you put your name in, or do they get in touch with you? Uh, they got in touch with me, um, and the producers said they had seen a, a certain dirty rice video I did on the Internet. We did a video for Tasting Table, and I did, got around, and one of the producers said, yeah, I saw that. I knew we had to have you. I was upset. In fact, they were actually upset. They were like, where were you in the New Orleans season? I'm like, I don't know. That's your problem, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, where where were you? Yeah, <laughs> so, I probably wouldn't be able. I probably wouldn't have even been able to do it that season. To that season, we had just opened the restaurant. I'd have probably turned them down. Yeah. So it was actually kind of good that they waited for the California season. Also, it was really nice to not see anybody else from Louisiana. I didn't want to have to fight for that Louisiana uh, pull team. So I was kind of surprised I wasn't the only one, but I was relieved that I was the only one. So, so you get the spot, and they say, "Okay, we're flying you to right. We're we're flying you to uh to, to uh Hollywood. Okay, flight. <laughs> of course. O- okay. <laughs> wow. And you know, it's 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 very hush hush. They don't give you a whole lot of information. They want it to be a surprise. Mm-hmm. We when we meet each other on camera, we really are meeting each other for the first time. They want it to be genuine reaction, and that's what I appreciate about the show. Even though they had to be hush hush a lot of times, you know, they didn't tell you who was the guest judge was going to be until you saw them, so you could get a reaction. And, and now that I know that's like this is how you make a good show. So while it's annoying at sometimes or keep you in the dark. Uh, you realize that this is to make a good show, and it is to promote the chefs. And I felt they did a good job. They're not really trying to throw anybody under a bus. People do that on their own already. Uh, You know, they sit you down for these long interviews afterwards, and then they cherry-pick the best stuff, and it's obvious, like, oh, yeah, I just... I say what I want to say. Mm-hmm. I don't have to pull any punch anymore. I don't work for corporate anymore, uh, you know, or I, yeah. I don't have to worry about the boss. I don't only worry, worry about how my wife slapping me in the head when I say something stupid on TV. So far, I'm only at one. Well, you were really doing an incredible job. How hard has it been to keep all these secrets? Uh, pretty easy. It is? Pretty, yeah. It's, you it's mean pretty... your mom and dad aren't beating you up on it? No, no. I, it's actually it's kind of an enjoyable kind of torture, uh, not telling everyone. You know, you, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm like, no, you got to watch. <laughs> I could tell you I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd like to know what the watching it experience is really like. Oh, that's the worst. 
Uh, most of the time I've been watching it uh, live stream, so the first time I'm watching it is the first time everybody else is watching it. Uh, it's unnerving, and if I could put it into relation, uh, you know, people out there, have, have you ever heard yourself in a recording and want, I sound like that? Oh, God, really? That sounds horrible. Multiply that by 100, and you have yourself watching yourself on TV. It's unnerving. I wanted to throw up the whole first episode. I had to get drunk. I was drunk by the end of the first episode at my own bar. Man is like, okay, time to go. I'm fine. Oh, God. Isaac, welcome back to Louisiana Eats. I'm so glad to be catching up with you just like I dreamed right here in the restaurant on viewing night. I have to tell you that my first experience in the restaurant during a Top Chef airing was last week, and it was absolutely electric in here, but I could just tell that everything you were reliving, every misstep, everything you wished you had done differently, it was weighing on you so hard as I watched you and Amanda sitting at the bar, and all I could see was your back, and, you know, you're sitting next to him. It was very different sort of body dynamic because your arm was around him. It was clear, like, that you were like, okay, you can lean on me about this. How does it feel from your end? Um, you know, it's a little bit like getting your skin scrubbed off every week, you know, and you feel naked for a second, and then you go, and you get to put it all back on. You put your armor all the way back on, and you go, we got this, we can do this. You know, people say things. But Isaac and I do live by the mantra that if you have haters, you're doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, they, so they, they run into the whole food market again and again on Top Chef. I ran in so fast one time, I ran into the doors before they had time to open. <laughs> and then they tell us, it's like, okay, okay, you, you, know, you have 20 minutes to shop, you have 30 minutes to shop, but don't run real fast and run people over. Well, I like to clock the mini a grandma. <laughs> you clocked many a grandma. No, I, I, I almost did. I almost watch did. Watch out, grandma. Watch, 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 mama. Mama. <laughs> coming, coming through. Entree food. <laughs> now, a year after Isaac's stint on Top Chef, we sat down together in our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum to chat with him about how being a celebrity has changed his life. Uh, you know, it's, it's all changed for the good and, and just for a little bit for the weird. Uh, the good part is, you know, the meadery got so much business. I mean, the national attention from three months being on television gave us was unmatched as far as advertising and marketing go. Um, I mean, it was probably millions of dollars worth of advertising right there. I, I couldn't do the calculation. But it was great for the restaurant. It really put a lot of uh, people in seats. And let's face it, that's how you that's how you get the bills paid. So, I mean, for a good six months there, you know, you couldn't make a reservation. And that was great for us. Not so good for the locals who were pissed off they couldn't come get their, their Friday night seat. But, uh, you know, things have chilled out and we're bi- still very busy. But we had so much business that, hey... We can open up another restaurant, and we did. So you know, I, I'd be a fool and um, non-honest if I said that you know Top Chef didn't help very much with getting a ses- second restaurant in place. So I've got a lot to uh, thank for that. And at the same time, I probably wouldn't go do it again. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do it again? I don't know. You know, I don't know. It was it was great. It was great the first time around, but it was just a chore. I mean, mentally and physically and emotionally and and, and all that being away from your family and. The, the behind the scenes part and the drama and then you know watching yourself on TV it's uh it was good and weird good and weird why do you think that food competition television has replaced stand and stir and everything that existed before it one word popping entertainment and it's, it's it's also the other word would be drama People like drama. They like dirty laundry, and that's why people like to watch Real Housewives, and they like to watch Iron Chef and go like, oh, God, what's going to happen next? And while, you know, Stand and Stir uh, will always have those places, people just kind of want something different nowadays, and that's why guys like, you know, Emeril Lagasse, my my former boss, made the stir. It was stir and throw and yell, and people liked that. And then you got the off-kilter guys like Alton Brown going, this is kooky and weird. I like it. 
<laughs> and, you know, I still watch the old uh, Julia and Jock videos from back in the day. Oh, yeah. And Julia Cooks and Hubert Keller with his accent, and I love to watch that. But people want it etched up. People like to see that, that competition. Even though people can't taste their food, they like to see that drama. And people are like, oh, and I'm a chef now. I watched Top Chef one time. Well, now that people are familiar with you from TV, how has that affected your persona, your public persona? Are you being approached by people all the time who recognize you? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's hit and miss. Uh, you know, if I'm, I, I was, I'm in the airport all the time nowadays, and people pass by me like, are you from Wisconsin? I'm like, <laughs> no. Um, you don't work in the New Orleans culinary industry? No. You're not from Lafayette, are you? No. Do you watch Top Chef? Yes. And then they go, oh, it happens a lot more often when I'm wearing my chef coat. Uh-huh. And they look at my face and go, and make that make that face that says, man, where do I know that guy from? And look at my jacket and go, oh, you're Isaac oh. Toops. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Oh. And sometimes, you know, it's it's very, it's flattering. It's flattering what it is. And sometimes it's, it can be unnerving. I've had people, you know, my kids are screaming in my arms and, and someone comes running after me for a selfie. I'm like, really, dude? Yeah. But, you know, I'm always, I'm always nice about it. And most people are very friendly about it. There's always going to be some jerks in the pack, but most of the notoriety is very cool. So there have to be other doors that have opened, too, besides you opening another second door in your empire. Uh, Yeah, you know, I actually have, um, in a couple of days coming out, um, uh, Isaac Takes On on BravoTV.com. It's another little web series that we put together. We shot 10 episodes of me on a a celebrity cruise ship uh, going to the islands and battling Chef Enrique for a ceviche battle, uh, you know, and then going having a, um, um, a fungal battle on another island and then going on the cruise ship and challenging a, a, a classic trained French pastry chef and a tableside dessert. I won't tell you who won. <laughs> but, uh, no, you know, it was fun. It was very Top Chef-ish, and it was kind of the same production crew, and they liked me so much the first time. I said, hey, would you like to do it the second time? I said, maybe. They said, we'll pay you. And I said, okay. <laughs> like, oh, oh, money. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, how was that different than your Top Chef experience? It was just you and another chef one-on-one for one thing, huh? Uh, yes, it was just me and another chef, and sometimes it was the local chef at the restaurant we were at. It was very lighthearted. Uh, you know, there are no big consequences for winning or losing. It was much more in tune with learning something and getting to local cuisine and having a good time. So it was, it was Top Chef light. What other things are in the works for you, Isaac? Uh, you know, we got a bunch of things going on. We have a cookbook we're working on. Uh, me and uh, Jennifer uh, Cole are writing it. She's the previous editor for Southern Living and an absolutely marvelous food writer. Um, you know, our catering business is starting to take off. We've got another little production thing, which I can't be too much detailed on, which might happen. You never know. You never TV, know. TV's kind of weird. It's like, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Hey, in two days, can you film a series? Like, okay, come on. Uh-huh. But uh, so we've got a lot of irons at the fire, and we're always very busy. We're always traveling. We're in New York next week, on be on the Andy Cohen show. Uh, we'll do the uh, the the Today Show next month. It'll be the fourth time doing that. So I'm always doing something, Poppy. And I'm of the mindset that anytime anybody asks me to do anything, I do it because you never know what's going to be good. You never know what's going to get out to another people's ear to get people in your restaurant, and that's the bread and butter. <music> Our friend and neighbor, Isaac Toops. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Join us next week when we say, Opa! to Greece on the bayou. Everyone in New Orleans is, and all over uh, enjoy our traditions, so they keep coming to our festivals and enjoy the food and the pastries and the music. So that's what we're aiming to, just perpetuate the culture. I mean, bon appetit. <laughs> Have you missed an episode of Louisiana Eats? Hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com where you can also subscribe to the podcast and take us with you wherever you go. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarain's, French Market Coffee, and Rouse's Markets. 
Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Shreveport Bossier Convention and Tourist Bureau and by Dickie Brennan's Bourbon House. From oysters to redfish, serving fresh Gulf seafood on Bourbon Street. Original theme music by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to producers Joe Schreiner, Sarah Holtz, and Reggie Morris. Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Or see what we're up to at poppytooker.com. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook as well. I'm Poppy Tooker. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting.